Good day. What is Prey 2017? It's both easy to review and complicated at the same time. It is the future, today, but also has echoes of the past. It is a game that in 2017 transcended the trends of the market and they gave the player something unique. It gave the player a game to be immersed in. It gave the player a reason to stay up until 12 midnight again. It was what gaming was always meant to be. Prey 2017 should not be confused with the prior Alpha Prime game, Prey 2006. Those two games have absolutely nothing to do with one another. Prey was just a marketable and trademarkable name. If you want a review of the transcendent game of Prey 2006, just check the backlog for a full retrospective. Prey 2017 was developed by Arcane Studios and published in, you guessed it, 2017 for the various consoles and the mighty PC. Since this game is a new IP, there are no direct antecedents, but this game does have a few influences upon its design, most notably System Shock and Bioshock. Prey 2017 is what is called by some an immersive sim. It's a game that strives to immerse the player into a living world so that one feels like one has fully entered the gaming world without a VR thing strapped to their bloody face. Prey does this by giving the player a fully realized world to explore and by allowing the player to fully interact with the world they are in. The gameplay is geared towards being satisfying and thus challenges the player to think instead of just reacting. Or put another way, Prey 2017 is an open world Metroidvania first-person shooter survival horror RPG, but uh, it's a lot easier just to say immersive sim. The first-person shooter combat is classic. No iron sight aiming, just point gun at enemy and shoot until dead. Combat is absolutely brutal and extremely fast-paced. You can die in like a couple of seconds to even one of the weaker enemies. It's amazingly immersive and makes the game extremely tense. At least until you upgrade your weapons and then you can blast enemies in just one or two hits. You have non-regenerative health and you have to find health kits. These health kits will be very few and far between. There are some allies you can find in the game that will heal you and these will be a gift from the machine god. In addition to your health, you also have armor, which does a little bit to mitigate damage and can become permanently broken until you can find a repair kit. You get a good number of weapons to get to slaying with. You start with the humble wrench that is of course inspired by Bioshock and it's a good starting weapon as you will be using it to bash these little spider bastards to death. It's also a good weapon for when you want to save on ammo cause well this is a survival horror game and ammo is neither plentiful or easy to get. Your first ranged weapon is the glue gun. It shoots frozen balls of glop that freeze enemies. This will be your close personal friend of yours early game as it allows you to have just enough time to not die when facing the tougher enemies. This is also a tool to be used when traversing levels. You get your starting pistol a little bit later after the glop gun and it's pretty weak but better than nothing and helps you save on your shotgun ammo. The pistol itself looks pretty cool and is internally suppressed. Hope they filed that form! The shotgun is as the machine god intended. It is the best all around weapon in the game. It hits hard. One cool detail is that if you get zapped by an electric bastard, your ammo counter will fade away and be replaced by the loading symbol. Damn, I love immersive sims. Next, you got the Q-beam. It's mostly the game's BFG. The shotgun really stomps just about anything, but for the really big bastards, the Q-beam really comes into its own. You ejaculate a beam until the enemy's health bar turns green, and then they explode! The long charge up time and vulnerability to electrical attacks make this a weapon where some planning is needed before use. There are a few other weapons to be found such as the stunner and the dart gun. The stunner lets you non-lethally take down humans and the dart gun lets you hit unreachable switches. These two weapons are very situational and I never use them all that much outside of two or three areas. There are a few grenades to be found, each with some utility, but the recycler grenade is another best friend as it gives you the ability to get resources from enemies. Like an RPG, you loot the bodies of your defeated foes for ammo and health power-ups, but also JUNK! 
My favorite elements of the game are the recycler and the fabricator. Exploring in immersive sims is nothing new, but always having to be on the lookout for weapons and ammo makes it much less of a chore. And since even junk has a purpose, picking around each part of a level is even more fun still. You take junk and unneeded items to the recycler to turn it all into resources, and then you take your resources to the fabricator. This is where you can make plot specific items, but also ammo and health power ups. This makes the act of collecting junk fun. You know you're an overachiever when you make trash pick up something satisfying so remember kids always recycle to the extreme just don't be uh, smug and self-righteous about it prey 2017 has a hacking mini game where you have to guide your little bundle of ones and zeros through a maze to hack the web and get a wi-fi password it's fun enough and if you like to do a hacker build like i do it makes getting through all those doors a snap the level up system for prey 2017 is somewhat inspired by deus ex human revolution in that game you would accumulate xp and that would give you what's called a praxis kit and that would allow you to raise an attribute you can also buy praxis access kits as well. Prey 2017 forgoes the XP pool and just has you locate what are called neuromods. The more neuromods you find, the more skills you can upgrade. As you upgrade your skills, you will require more and more neuromods. Neuromods can be found all throughout the game, and you can manufacture them at the fabricator. There are a good number of builds to choose from. My build is a bit of a generalist one, and I focused primarily on hacking and the ability to navigate the levels, mainly because I did not want to leave any precious loot behind. The game also has a weapon upgrading system, but this is tied to the neuromod skills. The higher levels you have in gunsmithing, the more you can upgrade your weapons. In a Metroidvania element, you have to make yourself strong in order to pick up large boxes to open up new paths. You can also upgrade your repair skill and fix broken power conduits and broken machinery. You also have this game's equivalent to dark side powers that can give you abilities that some would consider unnatural but useful. These powers will generally be offensive in nature. In order to get these unnatural powers, you have to pick up another item called a psychoscope. This psychoscope will allow you to scan your various enemies, and the more enemies you scan, the more abilities you can unlock. But there is an issue with these powers. The more you select, the more dark you can potentially become, and you can possibly start being seen as one of those foul xenos. You can also upgrade your fight suit with a stat buff that are kind of boring but useful. You can also upgrade your Super Science Scanner, which I kind of just ignored, mainly because I did not go for a dark side run. Another RPG element is the character selection. You can choose between a manly man of manliness or a strong independent woman that don't need no man. This will have no effect on gameplay, and you will always be called Morgan Yu no matter which one you choose. Space, the Far Frontier. These are the voyages of Morgan Yu, his mission to seek out new life and exterminate it. So, you got Arcane Studios. These guys are overachievers. So how do they go to infinity and beyond? They let you go to space at any time you want. And when you go to space, you have six axes of freedom. Ah, uh, Descent. And it plays a bit like Descent too. And the overall physics work really well. And like in Dead Space 2, it's dead quiet, and you have to pick up your visual scanning to find and terminate foul Xenos beasts. This game is very much of the open world variety. There are not just linear levels, but instead you have the entirety of this massive Bioshock inspired art deco space station to explore, and you steadily unlock more and more of this space station as you play the game. Since this is an RPG, you also have individual quests to complete along with side quests, and like a good RPG, there are quite a few different paths one can take some that are darker than others. Prey 2017 takes a good number of gameplay styles and meshes them together and makes a goulash that is so delicious. Graphically, the game looks really bloody good even in 2022. Everything is well detailed and each part of the station has its own style. I really love the art deco look of the public parts of the station, especially when that's contrasted to the more futuristic workman parts. At no time does this game ever get boring to look at and you never feel like you're just going through the same hallways over and over again. 
This segment right here is one that shows off the graphical complexity of the game. You go through this transit tunnel and it legitimately feels huge and it's filled to the brim with enemies and cool detailing. And yes, you can go outside and see the entire bloody station and fly from top to bottom. This is truly next gen goodness. Human graphics look good, although like many modern games, some of the people look a bit too square faced for my taste. The enemies look amazing with all sorts of moving squiggly bits. Weapon models also look cool, with the Q being being the best to look at as it has all these fiddly gubbins on it. We are looking at the PC port of the game and it's pretty good, although there are a few minor issues. Controls and all the rest map well to the Xbox controller and you can even swap to the keyboard on the fly and the devs let you quick save from the menu so you don't even have to hit F5. However, the PC version doesn't run the best. There are texture pop-in issues and frame drops. I played this at 2K and there were textures popping in all the time. I was wondering why the textures look so crappy until magically they went from 2005 to 2017. There are frame drops during combat, which is kind of annoying, but not game breaking. There are apparently mods that fix this, but I have not tried them as of this recording. Despite the minor issues though, I didn't have any crashes at desktop and the game worked well enough. Sound for the game is fracking awesome. The monsters sound suitably scary, the weapons sound suitably powerful, and the science shit sounds, um, suitably sciencey. VA work is also excellent with everyone putting in a cinematic performance. As for the Mick Gordon, it's Mick Gordon. Mick Gordon creates an amazing Mick Gordon soundtrack that along with the sound design further gets you immersed into the world of the haunted space station Telos 1. And by Telos, this is Mick's second best soundtrack second only to Doom Eternal itself. The game uses atmospheric music and it's suitably creepy. Combat music ramps up to get your pulse pounding as you slay the midnight black beast from beyond human understanding. And you know this game is beyond top tier when even the fucking hacking music is really bloody catchy. When hacks ring, one can get to bopping along with the music to the point where you fail and you kind of want to fail because the music gets really good the less time you have. My favorite track is the rather iconic Everything's gonna be okay. Uh, if it was, this would be a real short game. Prey 2017 is a journey. It is a game that is long, hard, and makes you feel like you accomplished something at the end. The story begins with you choosing what gender you want to be, so for the entirety of this review, I will be the male Morgan Yu. You start up in an apartment ready for your first day at Transtar. It is the 2030s, and you are in the wretched urine-soaked hellhole that is San Francisco. You board a chopper to escape this hoarded place, and the intro cutscene rolls. The music is great, and everything seems like it will be okay. You meet your brother Alex Yu, and you are told that you have to go through some basic testing. It looks like your standard tutorial level. Uh, why are they surprised when I'm hiding behind a chair? And holy shit, that goose spider just killed a guy! Ah, uh, no forced foreshadowing, no bullshit, just pure immersion. And the game only gets far less okay from here. When you start the game, you will have no idea what is going on. After your initial cutscene, you're back in the apartment only to find, what a twist, you're on a space station. And from here, you have to find out what the hell is going on and how everything stopped being all right. You have to read everything to even get a glimpse of what world you were in and how the station got fucked up. The world of Prey 2017 is an alternate history. What we learn is that the space race didn't end with the moonshot. Instead, the US and the Soviet Union worked together to create a massive space station called Talos-1, which orbits the moon. And yes, if you look out a window, you can see the space station actually moving through space. You get called by January. He is what is called an operator, an artificial intelligence. He tells you that you need to go to your office where he will tell you more information. I expect this to happen a lot in the game. Everybody wants to tell you something, but you just have to get somewhere before they'll say it. To get there, you will need to fight foul Xenos beast called the Typhon. They were discovered by the People's Glorious Soviet Union and were the motivating factor for why the US and the Sovs worked together to build the space station. Eventually, the Soviet Union ran out of other people's money and the US took over the station and they decided to give all the senators a raise for the good of the nation and thus the station stood derelict for years until SpaceX, aka Trans 
Science Store bought the station and reactivated and turned it into a Major League Science facility. And in a nod to Doom 3, this station has all sorts of arcane and unethical science crap going on. One of the things that the scientists developed was the Neuromod. What is the Neuromod? It's the future but also the past. It is made from ground up typhon and it allows you to implant a skill directly into your brain via the eyes. Uh, count me out on that one. This will be your upgrade system. Not sure how injecting space goop into your brain makes you stronger, but whatever. If you remove a Neuromod, you will lose all your memories back to the point when the Neuromod was installed. Thus, we see that Prey 2017 is a well-seasoned goulash of cyberpunk and cosmic horror. The game is packed to the brim with details as well that can easily be missed on the first playthrough, as you have a shit ton of stuff to read and the universe has been fully fleshed out to the point where you can learn all about this alternate history by reading in-game books. You fight your way to the office and you get to watch a vlog via the Looking Glass Entertainment System. That of course is a nod to a certain video game developer and you get to talk to yourself. Your vlog tells you that you can trust the January operator but before he tells you any more, Alex you shuts down the server. And I love how in media when a connection is lost everything lights up like it's fucking World War 3. Whoa, calm down there, just reset the router already. Alex tells you to let him explain everything and just sit tight. It is at this point that the game plants the seed of Alex you either being the good or bad guy and it's up to the player's interpretation of events as to what Alex you really is. At this point, you will still barely know what is going on other than goop monsters bad. You will also be finding audio logs along the way that will give you some idea of the world you're in and it's not a nice one. All the people on Talos 1 talk like they are in a cyberpunk world and you know, they're unscrupulous, but Alex Yu sounds like he isn't evil. Hmm. The plot thickens. Your objective now is to fix the server connection by going to the office of the guy who invented the looking glass tech. Oddly convenient that the adventure was on this station and not some other country a million miles away. The plot thickens again when December calls you up and tells you to escape Telos 1 in an escape pod. At no time will you ever be given a straight answer about what is the best thing to do. Nothing is obvious and everything requires you to figure out what the best option is according to your own viewpoint. You learn a lot about the station and as you near the guts of the station, you find out that everything started on a Russian space probe. The Russians found the Typhon, a foul Xenos species that can replicate themselves at a geometric rate and are utterly inimical to human life. They are incapable of seeing humans as anything other than food, but they are not unintelligent animals. They are merely different and fucking creepy. They can straight up kill a human, but they can also take over a human's body and will wander around saying creepy crap. The Typhon are a really effective villain and they are not evil, merely indifferent. Pure HP Lovecraft goodness. As an aside, according to my research, old Hallie Phil was not racist in the literal sense, but instead he feared everyone different from what he considered normal. So you patch the looking glass with override.exe, go back to your office, and Morgan Yu says you need to kill everyone by rigging the station the blue. And you can do that or you can find another path. And this is where you will have access to some different endings and there are different methods to solving the quests and everyone's game will be a little bit different and so it's good guy general lots you can probably guess how I'm gonna run it. You first start the game by following January. He wants you to get some arming keys for the self-destruct. As this is an RPG, you know it ain't gonna be that easy. Your quest will take you all over Talos 1 and for the most part you'll just be following the plan but eventually you'll get involved with the other inhabitants of Talos 1 and this is where you will start to notice that the corpses all have names and that the devs are such mad lads that listening to the audio logs will make a difference in figuring out what the fuck is going on in this insane asylum. And so here is where you can be either a good guy or a bad guy. The game doesn't tell you what to do. You kind of just have to figure it out on your own. You've got some humans that are being mind controlled by a foul Xeno and you have to put them down without them snack barring themselves. You just stun them with the stun gun. Hope you picked it up and didn't trash it. At this point, you will meet two characters, a hot Asian babe trapped in space and a mother Russian cook. The Asian babe wants you to find out what happened to her partner. You find her all right. Scary Russian guy says that he will give you some supplies if you clear all the enemies. You do so, but then he tries to trap you in a freezer. In said freezer, you find the body of hot Asian babe's partner. 
oh dear. Even more tragic is that they have a fully fledged story in the audio logs. You tell Asian babe about her partner's death and she charges you with killing Russian dude. Good luck finding the bastard. Russian dude from here on out will taunt you and say cryptic scary crap. The game really starts to open up and you start to get a lot more choices. Such as, you can choose to either save or let this guy suffocate in a metal box. If you let him die, the game just keeps going and pretty much all of your other human interactions can be you just being an indifferent prick. As good guy General Lotz, we save the dude and then start interacting with humies. Since this is not an EA game with a plot written by a bro, humans were able to survive the onslaught of the Xenos and are holding up waiting for a hero. And M.U. is just the bad enough dude to save them. You can kill them all by letting the Typhon attack them, or you can save them by building a massive fuck off gun line of turrets. Um, dude, what the, what, what are you doing? Dude, what the hell man? Uh, maybe killing him just means leaving scissors and paste down. They don't seem to be very intelligent. The AI in this game is not bad, but man, the allied AI definitely needed a little bit of work. Cause holy crap. So you get some of the special guards. Uh, what the hell are you doing? Stay behind the goddamn gun line. Best and brightest, my ass. So you save the hapless crew of Talos 1 and move on. And during this part of the game, Alex Yu is still trying to stop you, meaning that you will need to power on the reactor and all the rest. But eventually, he wants you to meet him in his office. Now at this point, you don't really have much reason to trust anyone. They are all morally ambiguous or outright evil pieces of shit that are trying to make a bunch of money off of human suffering. Oh sure, you find that some of them actually care about their fellow man and some even join dubstep bands. Hey, that music's not all bad. Most of the others on the station have been killing people for the fun of it and doing some Japanese level of human experimentation. But the question is, can you kill them or leave them to die? And does that make you as inhuman as they are? Some objectives are merciful, like saving your Russian girlfriend by giving her her diabetes medication. But really, by being the good guy, you are helping evil people, and it's an interesting moral quandary. As an empathetic being, I cannot just let them all die, and so I decide to hear what Alex Yu has to say. And we get another one of those fancy looking glass videos, man, it's like 256 kilobytes. This time, we get Morgan Yu talking again, and he looks a bit like a junkie after a hit of good stuff. We learn that Morgan Yu was trying to create a device that would wipe out the Typhon if they ever escaped. And Morgan is using a lot of, shall we say, worry words like I think and my gut, so it leads the player to wonder if this uh, super fancy high tech device will really work at all. Also, Morgan is a dick which is why everyone is surprised if you suddenly act like a non-psychopathic revan to them. So here you go. You are on a space station filled with foul xenos with a taste for human flesh. You don't know what to trust or if you should really save anyone at all. You can blow the station in a big bada boom or you can save the station in a mental big bada boom. The game gives you no certainty as to which is the best option. So what do you choose? The Typhon are out there. If we blow the station, we lose all the data and trained personnel to actually fight the gelatinous gits. Blowing the station might kill the Typhon and might make people not study them, or just as likely a bit of Typhon will make it down to Earth and kill everyone. And all the people that knew how to fight them will be dead. And even if no Typhon makes to Earth, there is no guarantee that the Typhon might not show up again. So the safe bet is to go with the Null Wave device. The Typhon use what is called Coral. This is postulated to be a distributed neural network, and as the game goes on, it spreads throughout the station. You have to scan concentrations of this and take the data back to Alex. You do so, and surprise, robot apocalypse! Okay, well, it's not a real Robro attack. Instead, Stephen Blum is sent by Morgan and Alex's parents to sanitize the station. Yeah, that's gonna be an awkward Thanksgiving. Stephen Blum has taken over all the robots on the station and armed them with laser blasters. And so now it's up to Morgan to be a bad enough neuromod junkie to save the station from aliens and robots. So the game can either be easy or hard here. You can smash the Robs Magnus style, or you can hack them John Connor style and turn them against their fellows. 
So the game gives you a couple of options when it comes to old Stevie here. You can just blast him, but if you want a happier ending, you can steal his shuttle. But somebody's gotta fly that shuttle, and the only person who can fly it is Steven Blum. So what you gotta do, and this is suggested by a character that you have to save, is you can knock him out, and knocking him out does require a bit of a guide because it's not particularly obvious. Although, I say that, and when I did my first playthrough, I kind of just lucked out into figuring out how to do it. Anyway, you gotta knock out Steven Blum, and when you do, his neuromods will be removed, and he will forget why he's on the station in the first place. And thus, he will fly himself and a few other survivors off the station. As you would expect, as good guy, or morally ambiguous guy, General Lotz, I of course go through the much more convoluted thing of wiping his mind and saving as many people as I can even if those people are kind of crappy. And thus, the stage is set for the final countdown. The finale for the game is nothing short of God tier. Literally. So once Stephen Blum has been relegated to tough guy voices for all time, you finally meet up with Alex Yu in person. Problem though, he has a line of dialogue that implies that he still thinks you want to blow up the station even if you had been working with him to scan the coral, but whatever, deadlines I guess. It is at this point that you learn that the coral is indeed a giant neural net. But you also learn that it had been broadcasting a signal somewhere and then surprise, big giant god typhon! As you would expect, the big giant god typhon immediately begins attacking the station. Now, at this point, your brother falls unconscious for some reason. You could leave him to die, or you could grab him and toss him into his bunker. Now, why he fell unconscious in the first place is a little bit harder to figure out. As the morally ambiguous General Lotz, I decided to save him. Yeah, he is a bastard, but well, just leaving him to die doesn't sit right with me. So it's the final act. You can blow the station or activate the Null Ray. There is no boss fight if you decide to activate the Null Ray. And thus, the God Typhon remains a scary space Cthulhu. Yeah, a boss fight might be fun, but in terms of narrative, it's cool to think that none of your little weapons could actually hurt the thing. I mean, really, considering the size of it, why would a 12 gauge shotgun bother it? So you take the elevator to the bridge, push a button, and change history. Ouch, I saw that frame drop arcane. And thus the game draws to a close. The Earth has been saved, and humanity has a fighting chance against the fell forces of the deep stars. To say that this is an amazing, transcendent masterpiece is an understatement. If you've never heard of it, buy it. If you have played it, install it again. It is truly one of the best games I have ever played, and is in my top 20 personal favorites of all time. And so, I am General Lotz, wishing you good. Oh my god, I was wrong, it was Earth all along. I guess you finally made a Typhon out of me. I love you, Dr. Zess. Wait. What a twist! So, Bioshock gave the player a twist by having them be a pawn of the villain. Pray. They go one step beyond and make you have the ultimate mindfuck. You were a Typhon all along, and thus, well, you were in the Matrix. What was real and what wasn't? Did you make the right choices? Were Morgan and Alex you what they appeared? This ending comes out of nowhere, unless you go for the escape pod ending. And yeah, I did that one, because I was curious. And when you escape the station, you hear Alex talking about trying again, but I didn't know that you were a Typhon all along. The game never telegraphs this twist, but if you know it's coming, everything has meaning and you can catch all the epic subtlety. In the first part of the game, the scientists are wondering why you don't transform into different shapes. Later, you have some freakouts where you hear that you're being lied to. None of it makes sense until this very moment. And Alex, in an attempt to save humanity, has put some of humanity into a Typhon in an attempt to communicate with them. Turns out that some of the people you saved were real, but they died at some point and had their consciousnesses uploaded to a Robro. They sit in judgment of you, and if you are good guy Morgan, they will tell Alex that you can be trusted, and the more people you save, and the more good you do, the better the ending. I could never find that bloody Russian guy, so this bastard is like, kill him. 
kill him? I literally saved everybody! Even Steven Blum! And you're gonna say kill him because I didn't kill somebody? Screw you! Next time I'm gonna leave you to rot in space! So you learned that all that you did on the station was for naught. Apparently the real Morgan was unable to save anyone, and thus Earth has been conquered by the foul Xeno Menace. You were given a choice. You can take Alex's hand or kill everyone. As a non-psycho, I take his hand, and this is a very, very impactful scene. Alex says, we're gonna shape things up just like old times. And I love the animation on the hand where he pats your hand. It's just beautiful. The golden inning has your sludge arm turning human. Bloody mother Russian bastard. So, Prey 2017. Uh, it's a masterpiece through and through. But before we gush, let's first figure out the future for humanity. We learn that the coral stores the neural patterns, aka consciousness, of all dead humans. So, you know what I'm thinking, with Morgan Yu as a bridge between species, human and Typhon can work together and most humans can be restored to life by having new bodies created and the consciousnesses put into them. Then, using Typhon Tech, humanity can rebuild Earth and then head out into the stars and possibly communicate with other Typhon and stop them from rendering other species extinct. For a cosmic horror game that leaves you guessing all the time, this is a remarkably happy potential ending that I never want to see. Prey 2017 needs no sequel. It's fucking done. Humanity wins. Fuck yeah. Please do not create a horrible sequel that ruins this game's masterpiece status. It is a game that will keep you at that gaming chair until 3 a.m. busting for a piss and not wanting to stop because you gotta collect that last bit of junk to make shotgun shells. This is a game I beg thee to pick up. Get it on anything that runs games and lose a shit ton of productivity. You will most certainly not be disappointed. I am General Lotz, wishing you good enderall and good negrim or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and please consider leaving a like or a comment as the algorithm desires your soul. And I want to thank all those fans who have supported this channel, both past and present.